Hi, I'm Ryan Stamansky, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we've got a video talking about the VT fuse. The veritably timed fuse is one of those war-winning inventions of World War II that uh, I feel like comes up in a lot of our other videos. So we wanted to just do a short video to talk about that technology, its development and use, and why it's so important that we keep talking about it. This is not a complete technical study. There is a manual for the VT fuse linked in the comment section down below if you're interested in going into all those details. And there are some great resources and books and things out there about VT fuses and the various marks and models and uh, the development history of them. But uh, really, it's a very truncated development process. So here's the issue. Any aircraft rounds feature timed fuses. So you have to be able to guesstimate the speed an aircraft is approaching your vessel, or God forbid it's strafing parallel to your vessel, uh, and you've got to be able to calculate when your projectile is going to reach that aircraft and set a timed fuse, a mechanical fuse, to tell it to explode just when it gets in front of where that aircraft is flying, so they will create a cloud of shrapnel that will damage the aircraft. This is incredibly hard, particularly with World War II fire control equipment. And uh, most fire control was done optically at that point. Uh, even anti-aircraft work for the five inch guns, which do have directors, but uh, still in, in many cases, they were being optically trained and rotated to aim at these targets, especially early in the war. Radar is able to alleviate this somewhat, and radar uh, range finders for the various anti-aircraft guns could at least give you an accurate range. And if you know the range, you know how long it will take your shell to get to that range, so you can more or less time it right. And Battleship New Jersey has some very sophisticated analog uh, computers to calculate where you want a five inch projectile to explode called the Ford Mark I Able. Uh, even with this mechanically state-of-the-art system, it was still very, very difficult to time a fuse and have it explode in front of an aircraft. So you have to use your whole battery to set a barrage uh, and basically quantity over quality. So even before World War II started, people were always thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could develop a proximity fuse? A, a fuse that can detect when it is close to what it wants to destroy and just set itself off at that point. A number of different uh, processes were attempted by various countries, such as uh, using magnetism uh, and other weird scientific properties that are way beyond uh, my comprehension. But the system that ended up working was uh, basically putting a little radar transmitter and receiver in the nose of your projectile. It's sending out a radar signal as it uh, gets closer to the target that you've, you're shooting at. It's bouncing that signal back to the receiver much more frequently, and uh, that tells it that it's time to explode. In theory, this is great. In practice, Radar is a brand new technology. How do you shrink it down basically to the size of a Coke bottle so that it can fit in the nose of a five inch 38 caliber projectile? And uh, then how do you make that very sophisticated electronic device be capable of uh, being fired out of a gun at high speed and rotated? Uh, so there's a lot of centripetal force acting on this thing because of the rifling of the barrel. Um, so, the British were the first to tackle this project, and they were able to have some success with uh, what they called unrotated projectiles, uh, which is basically an early anti-aircraft rocket. Uh, and because the rocket is not being accelerated to the same speed as a projectile, a, a bullet or shell, and because it is not being rotated at all, uh, th they've had some success doing that but they still couldn't make something robust enough for an artillery round. 
Uh, and so during the Tizard mission, that was one of the topics that the U.S. and the British traded ideas on. Uh, so the U.S. started working on their own solution to this, and they were able to uh, come up with a working product. So basically, all of 1942, uh, the, the U.S. military is trying to create a better anti-aircraft round for its five-inch guns. And uh, they are able to get the system to be robust enough and small enough to work. Uh, vacuum tubes for hearing aids, it turned out, were small enough to be used for, elect for shrinking the electronics. And uh, it was found that if you kept the uh, liquid part of a battery in a little ampule in there that would break when the gun is fired, then you wouldn't have problems with your battery uh, becoming unstable after a couple of months and thus not being good for long-term storage of your projectiles. The battery doesn't activate itself until the shell's been fired and then it can activate the uh, electronics inside of the projectile. So the, these are just a few of a hundred different uh, issues and solutions that had to be found for creating the VT fuse. So long story short, by 1943, a fuse had been uh, developed, tested, and deployed. And a number of companies, including Radio Corporation of America here in Camden, New Jersey, uh, participated in building VT fuses. The shells were first used for testing on a warship uh, on board the light cruiser USS Cleveland. And uh, two days were slotted for her to do anti-aircraft practice. But apparently uh, they were canceled in very short order because the three target drones that were going to be used to test the anti-aircraft fire on were destroyed with just four projectiles. When you compare that to hundreds of projectiles that it takes to shoot down a normal uh, aircraft target, the, the fact that you were reducing that significantly was enough proof for the Navy to mass produce these things and get them out there. And uh, it was something like uh, a 20 to 1 reduction in projectiles needed to bring down individual aircraft after the VT fuse has been introduced. Uh, by this point in the war, Japan was on the back foot. Uh, however, these projectiles were brought out in time to destroy the last professional Japanese aviators during their air attacks on the carriers and uh, may have been a contributing factor to the Japanese development of the kamikaze. That's okay, I guess, because these were also the solution to the kamikaze. Smaller projectiles like 20 millimeter and the 40 millimeter couldn't destroy an aircraft entirely, but the five inch shells could. And having a VT fuse in that five inch shell allowed uh, them to actually be effective and you could engage different kamikazes with different gun mounts instead of having to barrage with your whole battery. Uh, and so kamikazes were one of three main success stories for the VT fuse. So they were primarily designed as a Navy anti-aircraft weapon and that's how they were first deployed and they were successful at this. Um, eventually they would be adopted in three inch, four inch and uh, five inch and six inch varieties for various anti-aircraft shells. And a couple of the similar sized British calibers, like four and a half inch and 4.7 inch and whatnot, because this was a joint and, uh, and 5.25 inch, because uh, this was a joint British US uh, invention. The second main success of the VT fuse was in protecting London from the V1 flying bomb. This was an early proto-missile uh, technology that was very small and very fast moving, so traditional anti-aircraft fire was having trouble engaging it. But the VT fuse was able to. In fact, it was so sensitive that uh, British coastal anti-aircraft batteries found that uh, 
they had a significant number of bird kills because the bird's return on the radar to the VT fuse was enough to set it off. Uh, so it was a sensitive enough weapon to destroy V-1 bombers. So basically, um, the British went from destroying something like 15% of uh, V-1 bombs to destroying 75% of them when they adopted the VT fuse for this sort of thing. Now, initially, not planned to use the VT fuse over land. This was such a top secret technology that uh, we didn't want one to misfire or be a dud and land on dry land where it could be recovered by the enemy, uh, which is why it started out as an anti-aircraft weapon over water. It's given to British Coastal Command because, again, any of their shells that miss end up falling into the English Channel, so over water again. Um, but it was being withheld as an army weapon. Well, the Battle of the Bulge happens, and the Germans knock the Allies on their back foot. And so Eisenhower basically demands that the VT fuse be allowed to be used for uh, the army. Some hundreds of thousands of rounds had already been produced for army caliber artillery weapons. And uh, the German army breaking through during the Battle of the Bulge was basically moving in uh, above ground with impunity because the weather was so bad that artillery observers couldn't uh, observe the fall of shot to be able to tell the shooters when to uh, set the timed fuses for. So the Germans felt completely safe moving above ground. Well, the VT fuse works on dry land the same way that it does against an aircraft. When you fire the projectile, as it gets close to the ground, it's picking up the uh, ground signal. And so it explodes in the air, causing a rain of shrapnel on the ground instead of hitting the ground and causing shrapnel to fly up into the air. Uh, which is very easy to protect yourself in a trench or a foxhole. Well, now, even if you're underground, when the shell senses the ground and explodes above it, it's raining the whole area with shrapnel. So German divisions were absolutely gutted by American artillery and had no idea what this new invention was. And so that was the, the third and final major success of the VT fuse during World War II. What's another... Uh, important technological invention during World War II? Let us know in the comment section down below. Maybe we'll make other videos like this one in the future. Bullship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of businesses and private individuals like yourselves. In particular, the support we've gotten from viewers like you has allowed us to go from making one video a week uh, to making five videos a week for the past 18 months. And we really appreciate that support. There's a link in the description if you'd like to continue helping us. And you can also support the museum by clicking the like, share, and subscribe buttons so that uh, more people hear about our channel. And that'll help you because it'll let you know when we're posting all this new content. Thanks for watching.